Okay, so this video was originally supposed to be about how the PS1 embodies gaming's good old days. Unfortunately, as I was writing the script, I did the thing you're not supposed to do, and I tried to look back at gaming's good old days objectively, and the entire script just fell apart. Like yeah, it was fun thinking about GoldenEye and Metal Gear Solid sleepovers with the boys, but then I remembered waking up with Sharpie all over my face and everyone trying to hit each other in the nuts. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that the story of the good old days is really just a story made up of nostalgic lies. It's a story about self-mythologizing, a story about culture, and what's crazy is, if you dig deep enough, it's about the fantasies a bunch of marketers made up in the 90s that would shape the gaming community for decades to come. Every story has its beginning, and this one, like many others, starts in a bedroom in my childhood home. The room belongs to my uncle, with a single unsuspecting object whose nostalgic memory has haunted me for decades. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures left over of this room, but the vibe is crucial for understanding the context of this story. So let me try to give you a quick virtual tour. So this is my uncle's room. This is not actually his room, but this is what it feels like to me in my head. It's paradise. He's got a Scarface poster. He's got cologne bottles and canisters of mousse all over the place, low pile carpet. The whole room smells like cigarette smoke for some reason. He was cool, man. He would go clubbing. He would go out on dates. He would constantly be out like way after midnight. I had to have been like seven or eight years old at the time, right? But most importantly to me and my cousins, he had a PS1. We would go in there and play PlayStation 1 like there was no tomorrow. Twisted Metal, NFL Blitz, some Star Wars game. But for some reason, the game that we played the most was a demo disc called PlayStation Underground. And I don't know how many core memories this is about to unlock, but this disc had like a bunch of stuff on it. So this thing had the Vault, a collection of playable game demos, a code book, hints, cheat codes, and strategy guides. It had a download station, which was like proto DLC, tech Q and A's. It had interviews on here, but we would spend most of our time playing Twisted Metal off of that first disc. My uncle never owned that game. He never owned Tomb Raider, but we played Tomb Raider. This was the holy grail of gaming. This was what got me in. So naturally, I wanted to go back and see what this thing was like, right? So I found this video. And I have to say, watching this now, it has not aged very well. You gotta subscribe to the Underground Magazine. And to subscribe, you gotta have a plan. Here's the plan. Get up off the couch. Step over the coffee table. No, no, don't look away. Walk through the dirty laundry. It is critical that you make no eye contact here with anyone, or they will try to make you pick things up. This doesn't really sound like a brand that knows or even respects its audience. And it's all really strange to me, but this was Sony's entire marketing strategy. This whole ethos fits in with the grungy trends of the 90s, you know, stuff like Nirvana, dirty hair, unkempt bedrooms. Being messy, edgy, and crude was this symbol for teenage rebellion, and video games wanted to prove that they could exist in that realm instead of being strictly relegated to status as toys for children. There's actually even a recent video for IGN where Andrew House, the former president and global CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, described it himself. The mindset was going to be of someone who was 17. If you were older, it was that sort of fun mindset that you had when you were 17, and that's what the platform's gonna offer. If you were younger than that, that it was what you aspired to be, that you aspired to be a 17 year old because that was cool and hip. What's crazy is that this strategy actually worked on me, even though I was only like nine years old at the time. I didn't even know who Kurt Cobain was, much less the grunge movement. I believe that video game marketing at the time really understood me, but did it? This is a earthbound ad saying that the game stinks. I feel like this is something that would come up in a marketing meeting today and people would be like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? Let's go to the next one. Ooh, okay. There is a beautiful naked woman on this page in case you didn't notice. When you've got Sega Saturn's triple 32-bit processing power, nothing else matters. I did notice that there's a naked woman on this page, Sega Saturn, and she did not help you sell this console. Ooh. Game Boy Advance SP for men the second best thing to do in the dark. What gamer would think that like mimicking a cologne 
or sex toy ad would be the right way to sell a Game Boy Advance SP. Dai Katana, John Romero's about to make you his bitch. Suck it down. I don't, can I even say that on YouTube? Goemon's Great Adventure. God knows what it's about, but it sure is fun. Is Goemon in the jacuzzi implied naked with a bunch of women? You're making fun of the game. I wonder what the Japanese teams that made these games were thinking. I wish I could have been a fly at the wall at that meeting where they presented this advertisement and then all the people there were just like, I mean, I know what it's about. <laughs> The new Game Boy Pocket, seriously distracting, plays all existing Game Boy software, price $49.99. $49.99? I guess that's pounds. Why is there a women's height up there? More Bandicoot than you ever hoped to see in a lifetime. Oh yeah, public indecency was huge at the time. The more you play with it, the harder it gets. Okay, we're gonna, we're skipping this one. Are you sure you want me to wear this? Tomb Raider 3, huh. It's all sex. Someone please get the guys who make cartridge games a cigarette and a blindfold. This ad's not even about Final Fantasy. It's just anti-cartridge games. Like you literally got one of the best games ever made in many people's eyes and that's how you, you're selling it? Come on, man. Fasten your seatbelts for a 360 degree burnout. The most striking thing to me about all these ads is how much the image of video games and video game culture differs from the reality. Most of these ads feel like they're made by 40 year old guys who don't really understand video games and who actually kind of look down on the people who play them too. Would you like to go to the dance? Many arrangements for the prom? Such a dork. Games of this period were legitimately some of the best ever made, but you might never tell from some of these ads. Sir, aren't these tests kind of easy? Suicide mission. Oh. Now that I'm older, I know that this stuff never represented who I was really, and I have to imagine more people out there feel the same way. To understand what's happening here, you have to understand what advertisers were thinking at this time. Hello, it's me, an advertiser from the 1990s. Let's say my goal is to sell a bunch of PlayStations, right? But the problem is I can only buy a TV ad and a magazine ad because the internet doesn't really exist. I can't make a bunch of advertisements to cater to people on a bunch of different platforms like Instagram and YouTube and stuff. This is gonna cost me a lot of money and I only have a couple ads that I can possibly buy. Now let's say the actual sphere of people who play games looks like this. There's no way I'm going to be able to cater to all them in one TV ad or one magazine ad. Like it, it's just not gonna work. So what I have to do instead is I have to hone in on one demographic that's gonna capture as many people as possible. And then I'm gonna do whatever I can to make everyone wish they were part of that group. If you're not a 17 year old dude and you don't wanna be a 17 year old dude in your heart of hearts, then you can just screw right off, man. We're not trying to sell PlayStations to you. One of the reasons why honing in on teen guys felt like the only viable marketing strategy at the time was because it fit into a larger cultural wave. On a macro level, video games were already associated with young men. And if you look into pretty much any advertising aesthetic at the time aimed at young men, it was all grungy, edgy stuff. Guys in the 90s didn't wanna associate themselves with media that seemed childish or feminine. So instead of trying to broaden gaming or culture's scope, game companies naturally took the path of least resistance. They just made everything edgy. All the other strategies came from that approach. First was the never-ending console wars, which really just helped break down the massive teenage dudes audience into smaller and more easy to target segments. But I think Donkey Kong is the best game ever. Donkey Kong sucks. You know something? You suck. But we shaped ourselves around it. If you had an N64, you were a Nintendo kid. And if you had a PS1, you were a PlayStation kid. That dog eat dog strategy had already been around for a while. Here's Tom Kalinske, former CEO of Sega America, talking about how Sega's rise to popularity wasn't so much about the games themselves as it was about this sense of competition. And I wanted to take on Nintendo, not by trying to do the same things they were doing. You know, we wanted to have games that were edgy. If the equivalency is an R-rated movie, we wanted an R-rated movie. Put all these things together and you have this grand cultural marketing force that doesn't care as much about the actual games or games culture as much as they care about cultivating a sense of alienation, skepticism, and misunderstood superiority in its fan base. We won't be told how to view the world. 
we will experience true freedom. We will not compromise. We will live the game through our hands. We will be in control of something. And so this false image started to form around video games that didn't really benefit anyone except for the executives who were trying to sell systems. And so as the marketing intended, gaming started to feel like one big powder keg of us versus them. You see how and why this would become a problem, right? If someone else didn't like video games, it's because they weren't trying hard enough or they were biased, not because, you know, the industry made basically zero effort to expand its extremely specific base. Yeah, that's that's some, something that we absolutely wanted to put into the game, the ability to launch a nuclear weapon, and more importantly, to be able to stockpile nuclear weapons. Instead of opening up doors, we closed them. Instead of broadening the perspective of what a gamer could be, we bought into the marketing segments and doubled down on them. The people selling these images didn't have our best interests in mind. They wanted to sell systems by appealing to our baser combative instincts, bullying us to mold ourselves into their cliques, empowered by this 90s monoculture that let them create immense social pressure. If gaming was part of your identity like it was mine, then there was nowhere else to go. Use your brain or lose your mind. The way I explain this is that it's kind of like the first friends you make when you go to a new school. If you're really big into video games and your class has 30 kids in it, of course you're gonna hang out with the only other people who play video games, even if they treat you like shit and you have nothing else in common. Gaming at that time was like that 30 kid class. But if you spend enough time around those kids that you have one thing in common with, you start to take after them. You change pieces of yourself to fit in. Eventually you settle into the clique and all of a sudden you're a middle schooler with no real identity but the one that surrounds you. Feeling like you're simultaneously at the center of the universe while also totally out of place no matter where you go. You start to believe that the identity you've built around the monoculture is who you really are. You're underground now. There's no going back. It's kind of wild to realize how many realities became hidden by these nostalgic facades that came to plaster over them. And it all makes me wonder, what other amazing realities does this monocultural record hide from us? Welcome to 2023. Luckily, because we live in the future, we actually have the answers to these questions. We live in a world where things that we considered impossible in 1997 have actually come to pass. For one, games aren't just for teenage boys. Maybe you're an RPG person who's way more into Baldur's Gate and Zelda type stuff. Maybe you're the FIFA, GTA 5, Call of Duty kid. Maybe you're a cozy gamer. All of these are valid, legitimate gamers, and I've got to say, as an adult, it feels so nice when you finally find your community among the millions out there and you understand what it's actually like to be long in a space instead of feeling resented by the few people who are actually supposed to be on your side. I'm not bringing all this up to say that things are perfect now, or that video games were actually terrible in the 1990s. I'm simply presenting the current state of gaming as evidence that a broader audience was always achievable for video games. It was just a much harder sell for marketers. And that would have a lot more cultural reverberations over the next couple decades. But that's, um, but that's a whole nother video. So why does this all feel so nostalgic? Why do I still long for these days? Well, to be honest, I don't think I miss all this, at least not the marketing and media aspects. My nostalgia for the most part is for the games themselves, seeing a 3D world fully brought to life for the first time, the immense realization that these polygons could come together to make images that looked so real, the music, the feeling of punching the square button over and over, the movement on the screen. Most of all though, I miss those childhood days spent in my uncle's room, surrounded by the people closest to me. After moving out of my grandparents' multi-generational, ancestral home that my uncle's room was in, my family would drive by every once in a while for old time's sake, and we'd see something totally unfamiliar to us. The building was still there, but it felt off. The neighborhood had been totally gentrified. All the feelings we had associated with it had disappeared. It was just someone else's house. The ads, magazines, and recorded documents of gaming in the 1990s are still here too, and for a long time I saw them as a way of summoning up my feelings feelings from back then, but it never really worked. And now I realize it's because looking at all that stuff is also like looking at the occupied husk of your old house. It's a place where you may have felt comfortable at some point, but which never really cared about you on its own. 
It's time to throw away the idea that you could find an accurate depiction of the good old days in a magazine or a TV ad or a newspaper. The more we cling on to those, the more we reinforce someone else's image of the past that's way more closed off and way more boring than the reality. Whatever your uncle's room was, share it, embrace it, appreciate the variety of experiences that really existed at the time, and maybe we can build a new memory of the good old days that doesn't hold us back. Thanks so much for watching to the end of the video. It means a ton. If you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe and check out Superculture for more videos, writing, and podcasts about games.